Hi, my name's Guy Riddihoff, and I'm one of the editors at Science Magazine. And today I'm talking with Emmanuel Charpentier from Umeå University in Sweden. And Emmanuel's going to tell us about a system of repeats in bacteria which have turned out to be really important in genome engineering and potentially for human therapeutic purposes too. Emmanuel, can you set the stage for us with regard to these funny repeats that were found some time ago? Yeah, so the repeats were found uh, quite some time ago because it was in the 80s by a Japanese group uh -huh. who just describes uh, a series of, of repeats in bacteria. And this was not really followed up until the mid-90s and 90s, where some researchers found out that actually this series of repeats could be transcribed as RNAs that could be processed. And then in mid, beginning 2000 and to, uh, mid 2000s, some bioinformaticians figured out that actually next to the repeats you had a set of genes that was encoding uh, the so-called CRISPR-associated proteins and that those proteins had really characteristics of DNA and RNA interacting proteins. And the idea was that maybe the system uh, would work as an adaptive uh, immune system that would allow bacteria and also archaea, because the system is also found in, in archaea, to defend themselves against mobile genetic elements, so plasmids and phages. What was, what was the evidence that it, it was a defense system. It was something to do with the sequence There of were two, two, two evidence. So this was really this set of genes encoding the proteins with DNA and RNA interacting functions, mm -hmm. putative functions. And then the fact that uh, there are uh, very short uh, sequences interspaced between the repeats mm -hmm. that are called spacer sequences. Yeah. And those spacer sequences have as origins, always mobile genetic elements, most of the time mobile genetic elements. Sometimes they can have also as origins actually uh, pieces of sequences uh, in, in, from the genome. And so the idea was that maybe these this, uh, very small uh, sequences were actually memory devices uh, with regard to a mechanism whereby bacteria and archaea encounter for the first time a mobile genetic element, a phage or a plasmid, will recognize the entering DNA of this mobile genetic element will cleave this this piece a piece of DNA of this uh, mobile genetic element to insert it into the CRISPR array, and that this will work uh, consequently as a kind of memory device. The bacteria and archaea have memorized the infection, and then upon a second infection, this uh, this kind of memory sequence is transcribed as a, as an RNA component that is called the CRISPR RNA and that will guide a series of, of CRISPR-associated proteins to the invading genome upon a second infection. And that will be recognition by base pairing interaction between the RNA that contains the, the signature of the mobile genetic element and the DNA or the RNA of the mobile genetic element. So the, so the, the bacteria or the archaea somehow takes a piece of the invading foreign DNA and pops it in as a spacer into the system and then retrieves it through transcription, so it has an RNA that it uses in some way to identify through, well, we know how, but through homologous base pairing. Yeah. And then that is the way that it then deals with its infection. Now, your entry into this field was through small RNAs, right? Yes, it was through small RNAs, actually. So in my lab, we are uh, mainly focusing on bacterial pathogens, human bacterial pathogens. And we are mainly working with uh, a human pathogen that is called Streptococcus pyogenes, also, mm -hmm. also known as Group A Streptococcus. And we are mainly interested in understanding how this bacterium causes diseases in humans by approaching the questions with regard to understanding the different mechanisms of gene and protein regulation that allow the bacteria to adapt to their environment, survive in their environment, cause disease and also, to a certain extent, how the human host defends itself against the infection by Streptococcus pyogenes. And uh, actually, around the mid-2000, we were really interested in the, small of the, the family of small regulatory RNAs. And we started with a bioinformatic... I mean, we started actually to, to focus on, on two small RNAs mm -hmm. that we could show at some roles in, in the virulence of, of, the, of the bacterium. 
And then we wanted to have uh, an idea of the landscape of the small regulatory RNAs that could be encoded by this bacterium, and we performed a bioinformatics screen, looking for those small regulatory RNAs that potentially are not supposed to code for proteins. And we found a lot of them, and we focused on one that is now known as, as tracer RNA. And we also identified the fact that this tracer RNA was located next to the CRISPR system, Can I the ask, type 2 system. Can I mm -hmm. ask you why you picked the tracer, that particular RNA? We, we picked this, uh, this RNA because we were validating uh, the, the putative RNAs that we were identifying by northern blot analysis. And this tracer RNA was very well expressed by northern blot analysis, and it was expressed into three different forms. Uh, actually four different forms and we had mapped this RNA and we had found that there were two primary transcripts and one processed form and so we thought that it was well expressed and that uh, yeah it, it would be uh, an RNA that I don't know I, 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 something like a gut feeling that that it could be an RNA that could also work in, in trans compared to the other classes of RNAs that work in cis or that are belonging to the family of riboswitches so this was really a, a, a gut feeling And very fast, actually, we also tried to identify, uh, using bioinformatic tools, whether this, this regulatory RNA will target a messenger RNA. Mm -hmm. And we found a very nice target, mm -hmm. whereby this uh, tracer RNA can really base pair with this messenger RNA. This messenger RNA was coding for a, for a virulence factor. However, we could not make any sense of this very nice interaction. Yeah. And so at some point, since it was clear that tracer RNA uh, is located in the vicinity of the type 2 CRISPR-Cas system, so now known as a, more the CRISPR-Cas9 system, mm -hmm. uh, the, we, we just uh, had the, the idea that maybe uh, tracer RNA and, and, and the CRISPR system could have something to see with, with, with each other. This was not something that was so evident. Uh -huh. uh, ultimately, it took some time, but ultimately, uh, uh, Elitza Delcheva from my lab, a master student, and, and Christoph Chilinski uh, did an experiment that was relatively easy. We had the knockout of tracer RNA, we had the knockout of CRISPR RNA, and the idea was to look whether in the knockout of each RNA we would see a change of expression of the other RNA. And very fast we saw that indeed the two RNAs needed uh, one each other to to co-process one each other and so we, we started by working on, on CRISPR-Cas uh, this way. And we had also an interest in, in working on the CRISPR-Cas system in, in strep pyogenes because small RNAs are involved. I mean CRISPR RNA is just a small RNA. Mm -hmm. And in strep pyogenes the spacers target uh, temperate phages hmm. that are important in strep pyogenes because those temperate phages carry around the virulence genes. So they really contribute to the to the virulence fitness of the bacterium. So for us, it was a way to show that for the first time that CRISPR-Cas would have a role in a way in virulence by just limiting the acquisition of virulence genes. So we found that it was interesting because when we were starting to work on CRISPR-Cas, what was found is that by the group of, of Silva Moano, Philippe Orvarts with Rodolf Barangu, is that the system was indeed an adaptive immune system against lytic phages, but really the phages that kill the, the bacteria. So we saw that physiologically speaking, at the time when we were working in the lab, that it would be nice to have an, another spin with regard to the, to the function of the system. So that's why we were working with the two systems in parallel, and then we, we ended up to to connect the system and this uh, ended up very fast to show that yeah the, the two RNAs were interacting, were stabilized by Cas9, would be cleaved by RNA3 and then uh, yeah for sure we we had uh, in my lab it was clear that it will not be the end of, of tracer RNA although it was not that evident uh -huh. and then ultimately yeah uh, my student did the experiment to show that this is an enzyme using two RNAs to cleave uh, invading uh, phages basically. And, and the tracer RNA is, is a distinguishing feature compared to the type 1 and type 3 CRISPR-Cas CRISPR -Cas system, is that right? The, the, the tracer RNA mm -hmm. is a distinguishing feature. Yes, it's a distinguishing uh, feature, indeed. And so, can you explain briefly and simply yeah, yeah, yeah. So how, how, the, how, the, how the type 2 system works? Yes. So tracer RNA is an RNA that contains an anti-repeat mm -hmm. and that allows it to base pair with each of the repeat of the of the CRISPR array. Yeah. So you have a duplex RNA that is formed mm -hmm. at the level of the on repeat anti-repeat interactions. Then Cas9, the mechanism is not especially well known now, it's going to happen really in vivo, but Cas9 will stabilize the duplex. 
RNA3, which is an enzyme from the bacterium, will recognize this duplex RNA and will cleave. Mm -hmm. And this will give rise to a, a, a complex with Cas9, an intermediate form of, of the CRISPR RNA composed of a portion of the repeat, the full spacer that targets the, the phage genome, mm -hmm. and another part of the repeat yeah. bound to, to CRISPR, to, to, the, to the tracer RNA yes. that is maturated. And this, at the time where we, we deciphered this, this pathway, uh, actually the thoughts were maybe that then tracer RNA would somehow leave the system because the idea was that tracer RNA would be important only to, to somehow uh, help the maturation of this CRISPR RNA. But at the end of the day, <laughs> the duplex RNA is still, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, stable uh -huh. with Cas9. There is another maturation event taking place that allows to maturate further the, the CRISPR RNA so that you can have the mature form with each individual CRISPR RNA composed of a portion of the spacer, a portion of the repeat bound to tracer RNA stabilized with Cas9 and then those two RNAs are going to, 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 to be able to guide Cas9 to the invading genome and Cas9 will use two nuclease domains that is a very specific uh, particularity of this enzyme it has two nuclease domains to cleave each strand of, of the DNA in a double-stranded uh, manner. So the the tracer RNA and the interaction with the with with the with the other RNA, it's it's all part of a system to set up Cas9 so that it is primed and ready to identify its target. Exactly. And then it's really a guide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then and then to destroy its target. When uh, and of course, at what at what point did you realize? That not only is this very interesting in terms of understanding how you can ha how prokaryotes can protect themselves against invading nucleic acids, but also it has huge potential. Well, we know it more than huge potential. We know it's, it's yeah. uh, of great biotechnological use. At what point did you realise that it could also have this biotechnological application? Yes. Yeah, so you know me. I'm always performing my research, uh, the research in the lab at the fundamental level, uh -huh. but. Always because I started a little bit in the field of medical microbiology and I'm working on bacterial pathogens, so we are always trying to find interesting pathways and mechanisms that would ultimately lead to, to nice targets for anti-infectives or new strategies for, for therapeutics. So I always have this in mind. And then in the, in the past, I, or I developed actually genetic tools to facilitate the manipulation of, of gram-positive uh, bacteria and I've also worked with mouse models. So uh, I was a bit always obsessed in, in finding always trying to exploit what we are doing in the lab to, to somehow uh, potentially exploit what we have found in, yeah, in tools or, or, or new ways to, to, to treat diseases. Mm -hmm. So this, at least for me, came relatively fast. Uh -huh. Just because, uh, yeah, when you work on small RNAs with antisense mechanisms, you always know that in principle you, you may uh, find a, 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 a new genome silencing uh, mechanism that could be exploited further. Like RNAi, right? Like RNAi. Yeah. Uh, what was specific with, uh, with CRISPR-Cas is that it can target RNA, but it, most of the systems target DNA. Mm -hmm. That was a little bit new. And this was also something that was also an interest in my lab, is that if we wanted to find something new with an RNA, uh, it was known that the small RNAs in bacteria can uh, target proteins and titer them away from their function. It was also known that they can interact with messenger RNA and, and affect the stability of the messenger RNA or the translation of those messenger RNA. What was missing is a little bit, yeah, something like CRISPR-Cas, which was an RNA-guided system that would target DNA. Mm -hmm. And and then the idea that uh, that yeah actually the idea that it could be uh, that it could be exploited for even the treatment of human genetic disorders uh, came relatively fast in my mind uh, actually uh, for reasons that uh, I, yeah as I think because uh, I, I just maybe uh, uh, how do you say could foresee. <laughs> Uh, an exploitation beyond the bacteriology uh, aspect with regard to the fact that maybe the tool could be used for, for, for uh, uh, the genetics in bacteria, but it could also be, be used for, for genetics in, in eukaryotes. This was also in reference with talents and zinc finger nucleases that are at the end of the day uh, uh, nucleases that are also uh, recognized as, as uh, precise gene surgery tools 
that function uh, uh, well in, in, in eukaryotes that were uh, described a couple of years ago. Now, yeah, people switch to CRISPR-Cas9, but... Uh, I, I guess, and the switch, the switch to CRISPR-Cas9 is because you're directing the nuclease using an, an RNA, nucleic acid hybridization with the target, which is, and so in terms of identifying and getting your nuclease to the target, it's much more facile than having to design, say, for example, a zinc finger. Exactly, exactly. Which is a much more complicated exactly. and more exactly. long-winded process. Exactly. And so, I mean, I, it would be fair to say there's been, over the last several years since the work you did has been published, there's been a complete revolution in the way that, well, one as one the, the most obvious and immediate aspect was genome engineering. You want to tell us something about what well, genome engineering and some some of the other applications that, that, that this yes. CRISPR Cas9 has been used for. I, I think the reason why uh, uh, CRISPR Cas9 uh, is, is so successful it's because actually the biologists were really in need of an easy tool that would allow to to perform precise surgery in the genomes of eukaryotes. And I remember when I was working with mice, uh, this was also the reasons why I went back to the to the bacteria because it's, it can be really frustrating to, to not be able to to manipulate the genome and play around with, with the genes as, as you would like to, to do. So this was really uh, uh, clear that the biologists were in need of, 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 this, uh, of this tool. So it has a number of applications in the sense that it facilitates really the, the understanding of function of genes because it allows really now the biologists to, to perform knockouts uh, in an easier fashion and also to, to correct the mutations more precisely and to know the role of certain mutations. Uh, it allows to, to, uh, to also, uh, uh, how do you say, help uh, all the biologists working in the epigenetics field because it has been developed as a tool that uh, allows to also uh, modify uh, the genes at, at will. Uh, it can also affect, uh, uh, so downregulate or upregulate uh, the expression of genes when it is harnessed for, for this purpose. So it, it can be harnessed as a kind of CRISPR I or CRISPR A uh, system, so a, a system that inhibits or activates uh, uh, the expression at the level of, of the RNA. Um, and something that is very nice is that I think it's, it's obviously very popular now as, as a tool that will really help the, the engineering of, of, uh, of uh, mouse models of, of diseases or humanized models of diseases, which I think is, uh, is an interesting uh, point to be able to, to study the cause of diseases, but also to be able to, to develop some screening methods to find new targets for therapeutics and to also use those models to, to uh, test uh, drugs in, in development. So I think in, uh, it has really an impact in, in the academic field, but also in the biotechnology and the, and the biopharmaceutical industry field with, with this aspect of really uh, boosting a little bit uh, uh, the understanding of genes. Uh. One, of the, one of the, I suppose, astonishing features of it is it, it seems to work so well in so many different situations, in different organisms, different cells. Mm that obviously it, it doesn't involve many components that you have to introduce to make to make your to make the system work and be usable and then it can it seems it's going to revolutionize our study of of almost any organism you care to identify yes indeed indeed and and i think was, this is also the reason why it has been picked up very fast is that the tools available to just uh, express the system and to bring the system uh, to the right place and as a matter of fact to the nucleus which is not existing in bacteria are ex are here so the the manipulators just needed to to take those specific components of the of the cas9 and the single guide rna express those components in uh, in uh, in their vectors that they are using every day and then the system will just uh, will just work so perhaps one of the you know one of the one of the ultimate goals, perhaps, is is of course treatment of human diseases, and of course yes. that that's 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 tricky and also not without its technical issues as well. What, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, I think uh, the the actually the human gene therapy field has has made a lot of, of progress lately, and here again uh, the scientists were really in need of of. Of, of the tool that would allow to, to facilitate uh, the precise manipulation of, of the genes. 
Uh, now what will be important is to develop for sure all these delivery tools according to the, to the, to the CRISPR-Cas9 technology and, and to also work on, on the specificity of, of CRISPR-Cas9 uh, that depending on the cell systems and depending also on the way the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, tool is delivered is actually as shown to be quite, uh, to, to be very specific but for sure with regard to human gene therapy whether it's in vivo or ex vivo um, one needs to, to work on in, in this direction, but uh, so far I think uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is, is extremely promising, this is clear. Uh, that is why uh, everyone is working with the tool, and I think uh, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, sure that, uh, that uh, the years to come will, will show nice developments with regard to, to the technology and with regard to, to, the, to the delivery of the technology to help uh, to help the, the treatment of, of human diseases, combining gene therapy with cell therapy uh, at first. Mm -hmm. So, CRISPR-Cas isn't the only thing that you work on in your lab. Mm -hmm. You also have other areas you're interested in. Why don't you just very briefly finish off the talk by telling us a little bit about another area of research that you're interested in. Yes, yeah, so we are really interested in RNA and protein-mediated regulation. So we have the small regulatory RNAs, we have the RNAs that are also important components with regard to the biology of the small regulatory RNAs and to also the, the degradation of messenger RNA. Uh, we have also a thematic uh, focused on, on understanding uh, the protein quality control in bacteria, uh, protein turnover. Uh, that uh, is with regard to the fact that when bacteria are encountering, uh, encountering stress conditions, they can accumulate uh, misfolded proteins or, or aggregates of proteins that need to be resolved by specific proteolytic machineries. Otherwise, uh, those, those aggregates or those misfolded proteins could be toxic for the cells. Mm -hmm. And we focus on, uh, on a family of proteins called CLIP-mediated uh, uh, proteins that are involved in uh, so-called general proteolysis to, to the proteolysis that is more when bacteria uh, encounter stress conditions and then regulatory regulated proteolysis when it is really with regard to the regulation by proteolysis of certain factors upon uh, the normal life of the bacterium or certain adaptation uh, processes. Mm -hmm. And we are always looking uh, at those mechanisms in the context of the interaction between the bacteria and the host and, uh, and we have other nice projects uh, interesting also with regard to cell-cell communication between the bacteria and the host and the bacteria and the bacteria. So uh, we have a number of thematics in my lab. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Emmanuel, thanks very much for chatting Thank with us. Thank you very us. much. And, okay. uh, uh, you know, it's, um, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with CRISPR-Cas in the future. And I'm sure mm -hmm. you'll be involved with it. Yes, surely. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.